This is CBC Here and Now. It doesn't address this huge inequality that still exists in this province. Minimum wage will rise in April, but is it enough? It gives me a chance to thank the people that supported me when I first started. Carl English prepares to say goodbye from basketball as well as the edge at a ceremony on Sunday. We start tonight, though, with a story that will put more money in the pockets of a lot of people in this province. The minimum wage is going up. It's going to take a 25 cent jump in about six weeks, but that's just the start. There are going to be a total of four increases in the next year and a half. Now, as for the question of who's happy about this and who's not, here's here now's Peter Cowan. Right now, minimum wage in Newfoundland and Labrador is the second lowest in the country. At the end of this year, a record will be a little better. We'll be fourth from the bottom. Here's how it's going to happen. Right now, minimum wage in this province is $11.40 an hour. On April 1st, it'll go up 25 cents to $11.65 an hour. That's based on the cost of living. In October, it'll go up another 50 cents to $12.15. And it'll go up again next April by whatever the cost of living increase is, plus an extra 25 cents, and then another 25 cent increase next fall. In the past, government has only increased minimum wage to keep up with inflation. Here's what's different this time. We were falling behind other parts of the country and even with our Atlantic Canadian counterparts and that's not where we wanted to be in terms of looking at uh, taking a balanced approach for workers and for employers. Canada's announcement essentially just splits the difference. Business groups only wanted an increase that kept pace with inflation, so they're not happy. Labour groups wanted a much bigger increase, a $15 minimum wage, and so they're not happy either. Uh, currently we have about 70,000 people in Newfoundland and Labrador that are earning less than $15 an hour. So that's a huge amount of our population that are currently struggling day to day, paycheck to paycheck, to you know, afford the daily things that we need to survive in this province. So what will this increase cost businesses? The Department of Finance crunched the numbers. They figure it'll be about $100 million a year and they also expect it could cost jobs, cutting employment by about 400 person years. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a tense day has come and gone for a man accused of killing his brother. After a full day of deliberations, the jury has yet to return a verdict in Philip Butler's second degree murder trial. Now, Butler at his home in Conception Bay South on May 21st, 2018. Lawyers for the defense argued he was acting in self-defense. The prosecution argued that his version of events was just too good to be true. The trial spanned three weeks at the Supreme Court in St. John's. The jury will now deliberate into the weekend. Although snow squall is still very much on the go along the west coast as well as the Buren Peninsula and then the southern Avalon. We should start to see things change as we head through the overnight tonight, but we're still locked into this cold air at least for the next little bit. This area of low pressure just to the west is going to bring in some milder air as we head towards the weekend. It looks pretty quiet for most of us. I'll have all those details coming up. been noticing any strange names, uh, maybe street names or community names or anything? I mean, it's no secret to you. I've been asking you for lessons every morning on, like, uh, Pouch Coat. <laughs> yeah, Pouch and Coat. Yeah. The new co-host on CBC Radio St. John's Morning Show got a taste of his new world today. Ramraj Sharvandiran was introduced during a live broadcast from a downtown cafe and brewery this morning. Yes, brewery. But before all that, I got to take him on a tour around town. See how that went in just a few minutes. Well, Eastern Health will be turning on and testing a new piece of equipment this weekend, a machine that's encased in cement because of what's inside it. It's called a cyclotron, and it will produce the medical isotopes needed to operate the complicated scanners that help detect and improve cancer treatment. Because of the amount of radioactivity produced, the cyclotron is encased in extra thick concrete and lead walls. Eastern Health needed special approval from the Nuclear Safety Commission to set this thing up. And the startup is happening on the weekend. People in the area may notice quite a bit of extra security. 
A new community group wants support to help people with cognitive disabilities or mental health issues make important decisions about their lives. It's called the Right to Decide, and its members want to change how society views the decision-making ability of people with disabilities or mental health issues. Representatives from several community organizations met last night to talk about their ideas, and they hope, eventually, decision-making support will become a legally recognized alternative to legal guardianship. What we've seen is that when you take that kind of authority away from people, even if they have significant disabilities, people um, uh, lose more capacity. People become more isolated in the community. So the alternative is to simply figure out how to recognize, support people in a person's life, a family member, a brother, a parent, a friend who could go along with me to the bank and help me understand what's going on and uh, help me you know, execute a contract or a cell phone contract or a healthcare decision. That's all that, that so that's sort of what's, what's on the table here and the communities come together to look at how could we work together in this community to make that a reality for more people. Well, amidst the coronavirus outbreak, Memorial University's president says xenophobia and racism will not be tolerated at the school. Gary Kachanowski wrote a strongly worded statement that was published Wednesday in Munn's official news site, The Gazette. Kachanowski said he's been told that some members of the university community have been singled out and felt ostracized and mistreated since the outbreak. He didn't provide specifics and was not available for an interview, but in his statement said racism and xenophobia will not be tolerated on Munn campuses. Well, to date, there have been no confirmed cases of coronavirus in Newfoundland and Labrador. Kachanowski urged people to learn the facts and not make assumptions and judgments. In national news, the Prime Minister has called for an end to the protests that have stopped trains across much of the country. The protests are held in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en chiefs op opposing a pipeline on Indigenous lands in British Columbia. The barricades must now come down. The injunctions must be obeyed and the law must be upheld. The Prime Minister held a news conference late this afternoon. Trudeau says his government has done everything it can to peacefully end the blockades that are crippling the country's rail network. But now, he says, Indigenous leaders have to act. The protests have put 1,500 railway workers temporarily out of work and they've disrupted the transportation of food, farm products, consumer goods and some essential items. The Supreme Court of Canada has dismissed an appeal by Newfoundland and Labrador to strike parts of a lawsuit by Innu Nation in Quebec. The Innu are seeking $900 million in compensation from the Iron Ore of Company of Canada, which is mostly owned by Rio Tinto. The lawsuit claims operators caused the Innu harm since the 1950s by operating mines and a railway on their traditional territory without their consent. The court doesn't give any reasons for its decision. Well, the town of CBS is asking people to stay away from part of the trailway. The western end was heavily damaged in the January blizzard and the town says it's just not safe and shouldn't be used at all. About 10 kilometers of the trailway is closed from Delaney's Road to Indian Pond Place. The town has started to restore it. Well, our colleagues at CBC Radio's St. John's Morning Show got to show off their new host this morning. He was introduced during a live broadcast from a downtown cafe and brewery this morning. And as you might expect, being a former host of that very show, I'm quite interested in giving him the lowdown of this place that he's come to. So we went for a little drive. Good morning. You're listening to the St. John's Morning Show. I'm Ramrod Sharvandra, and the time now is... Oh, you're Ron, the new guy, right? Yeah. Oh, now look, I used to sit in that chair. You're a newcomer. You got to get to know the place, so let's go. Okay. Cape Spear, the easternmost point in North America. Is it always this windy out here? And from Cape Spear to Signal Hill, where Marconi made history. But I only have one bar. <laughs> And beautiful Middle Cove Beach, a great place to hang out with your friends. I dare you to jump in. Let's come back in July. And of course, there's Newfoundland fine cuisine. You do know I'm a vegetarian, right? And there's the Rooms, which is the archive and museum of Newfoundland and Labrador. Aren't they having a job there? 
Okay, there's your Whirlwind Tour ROM. It's time to play Get to Know Ya. We're setting up the clock on the screen as you see right there. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Because? It goes with more things. Museums or libraries? Museums. Rock, classical, or country? Classical. Classical? Yeah. Why? Because I can zone out. Winter, summer, spring, or fall? Oh, spring. I love the rain. Spr <laughs> you are in luck, my friend. Toronto, Montreal? Ooh, Toronto. Because? I'm from there. All right, not for long. <laughs> All right, nervous about Monday? Terribly. New to Canada, new to skiing. We'll tag along as some oh. new <laughs> residents hit, emphasis hit, the slopes at Marble. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. Okay, a crisp day for most of us. Mm -hmm. And I mean crisp, not just the cold, but everywhere the car goes. There's still so much ice here in the St. John's ears. It's actually everywhere go. bad. Everywhere I went today, for lunch, ice, or what, yeah. I, like I almost fell. I don't know how many times. You need those it's, things on your feet. Yes, those things on your feet. The 
crampons. There you go. <laughs> crampons. I don't want to. We had this debate. Called. We had this debate about what to call them. Never mind. She's. You're better off. Okay. The pointy, sticky things That's that help right. you walk. That help Bam. you walk on ice. Yeah, yes. you, you do need them. Mm. Uh, also, I noticed it's kind of temperature. We want to make sure your gas tank is filled. Yeah. You know, some people say, "Oh, wait a second now." Mm -hmm. uh, so do that as well. Mm -hmm. Are we getting much of this cold? More of this? It feels like February for sure. Right? It definitely yeah. does. And you know what? Last year at this time, it was this cold as well. Because yeah. I remember we were doing that freezing an egg thing remember that's that that's right yeah pipes were freezing all across they the were, city yeah but uh we're pretty much out of that cold air now i mean as we head through <sighs> the night tonight but a little bit of relief on the way so that's good. certainly good news but uh, we do have some onshore flurries or snow squalls still on the go along the west coast you can see them there and then if we move over to the avalon you can see that they're starting to taper off and that's because we're seeing a wind shift so those uh snow squall warnings for the southern avalon have since ended just about uh, not even five minutes ago and uh, they're still in place from corner brook through to the port of port peninsula but i do anticipate that that will end as we head through the night tonight now the good thing to look forward to is the fact that we're gaining about three minutes a day uh, with that sunshine so we are able to enjoy it at least now that the sun is shining up through labrador you're you're getting about four minutes a day and that's going to continue and we're less than a month away from spring, if we can call it that. But uh, here's where we're sitting temperature wise minus 14 for Lab City, minus 11 in Corner Brook. And as you head towards the Avalon, we're in those minus single digits. Those wind chills, though, because those winds have eased a little bit, not that bad into the minus teens right now, minus 25 for Happy Valley Goose Bay and same thing for Lab City. Now I mentioned that wind shift, so we should see things taper off tonight as far as those snow squalls go. And it's actually going to be a pretty lovely evening other than the cold temperatures, but you're looking at snow up through Labrador for most of us or for most of you rather tonight and then some breezy winds on the go as well. So if we take a look at those temperatures, minus 12 for Corner Brook, southwesterlies, there's that wind shift I was talking about, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, west northwesterlies for the east, uh, around 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. So a nice night if you are planning on heading out, just make sure you're gonna bundle up. And then uh, minus 15 for Lab City tonight, again, there's those, that potential for some flurries across the board. Minus 17 will be the overnight low for Cartwright. Heading through the day tomorrow, the first half of the day actually looks pretty lovely for most of the island. We're going to see some increasing cloud and then some flurries developing along the west coast, uh, the strait as well. And then uh, generally some cloud cover and flurries expected right across the board for the big land. By afternoon, we start to get into that onshore flow south coast. You're probably going to see some onshore flurries and then that will spread across the island as we head into the overnight and uh, early morning hours towards the Avalon is when we'll start to see some cloud cover, but those temperatures are going to be quite lovely tomorrow. Uh, jumping up about five, four to five degrees for most of us, minus five for St. John's, minus three for Bonavista, showing sunshine for most of the day, but again, increasing cloud flurries towards the uh, overnight hours, southwesterlies 20 to 40, so just a little breezy through the day. Otherwise, we'll see some flurries essentially move through across the rest of the island, minus four for Corner, uh, Clarenville, Minus four for Grand Falls, Windsor as well. And as we head towards the coast, similar temperatures with uh, some southwesterlies, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Up through the northern peninsula, minus six for St. Anthony. And those minus single digits up through Labrador as well. Plenty of sunshine for Cartwright. You'll see flurries later on in the day. And then as we head towards the western portion of Labrador, Lab City, you're sitting at minus six. So quite nice as far as temperatures go. We're going to hang on to some of these warmer temperatures as well as we head towards Sunday. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, now to a place where nobody complains about the snow. Marble Mountain welcomed new visitors this week who are also new to Canada. The Association for New Canadians took students on a ski trip, and here now is Troy Turner was there. Oh, my God. There may have been a little apprehension at times, but the thrill of downhill skiing came quickly. <laughs> Some exhilarating moments, especially with the completion of a run. It's amazing! <laughs> and plenty of times when they needed to get up and try again. No! <laughs> okay. Okay. Because the first time I, I couldn't control myself, but the second time I could a little more. But I'm trying, I need to control to turn left and turn right. But. Turning on to alpine skiing is a big step for these new Canadians. 11 students in the English as a Second Language program tried it this week. It's amazing because uh, at first, uh, I think we don't have the contacts or the people who knows here how it works and everything. And sometimes we 
we are afraid for to ask or something, how it works and everything. So they open a big door for us. So what does someone who has never tried downhill skiing before think of the experience? I feel like adrenaline, I think. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like like that sensation that you are just like, I don't know, like a falling, but you know everything will be okay. <laughs> I love that. Students in the English program range in age from 18 to 50. These field trips outside the classroom can offer a different type of learning and it could lead to further connection in the community. A lot of them are very new here and don't know where to access the things that they're interested in. So by us giving them, you know, a little push or showing them what's available, I think they'll be able to make more connections, meet people, get involved in the community. Integration into the community will continue with another trip planned for Marble later this month and a third possibly planned for March. As the Association for New Canadians continues to try to find ways to integrate its members into the community. Troy Turner, CBC News, Steadybrook. The School of Music at Munn involved in an exciting project creating what is likely the first ever opera album produced in the province. We'll go behind the scenes.
Well, possibly one of the largest music, music recording projects has been taking place this month at Memorial University's School of Music, and it could be the first ever opera album produced in this province. It features opera singer David Pomeroy and the 65 musicians of the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra, so we decided to visit one of the recording sessions at the D.F. Cook Recital Hall. I'm David Pomeroy from Goulas, Newfoundland, and I'm an opera singer. I really wanted to record the repertoire that I do on the operatic stages around the world, the things that I'm known for. As an international opera singer from Newfoundland, I felt it was really important to do it with my home symphony. Well, David and I have been uh, planning this for years and years, talking about it anyway, and we're just waiting for, waiting for the right moment to make it happen. And here we are. David is in his prime now. He's singing all over the world. He's singing these, these huge roles, as even moving into the held and tenor repertoire. And we said, now's the time to do it. So here we are. When you do a live performance, it's just very exciting, and you just you throw it off the cuff. It's just, you know, all your emotions are on your sleeve. But when you get into the studio, that's when the detail comes in. So we, we do the ten arias over four evenings, and we do two to three arias a night, and it takes a couple of hours to put it down. Because you, you, you record a segment, and then you go listen in the booth, and you see if you're happy with the sound, if, if you're happy with the intonation of yourself and the orchestra, and putting it together, it can, uh, it's, it's a big process, very different from live. David has is a very special talent with his tone color, his way of approaching these these uh, pieces, this repertoire, and he's doing this here at home with his orchestra, and that creates something very very special in terms of the energy that's surrounding this project. I'm sure opera lovers will, they may criticize, they may love it, but you know, it's me. It's David Pomeroy, it's not Pavarotti, it's not Corelli, it's me. And, it, and I feel it's really important that I put my own personal stamp on the way that I sing this music. All right, well, staying with classical music, but a totally different story. You might have seen a remarkable video this week of a musician playing her violin while she was undergoing brain surgery. Her playing helped the surgeons make sure that nothing was going wrong during the operation. Well, now she's back home on Britain's Isle of Wight, and the CBC's Briar Stewart went for a visit. Dagmar Turner has spent years developing the precise and speedy movements required to play the violin. She's part of the orchestra on Britain's Isle of Wight, but last month, delivered a most unlikely solo in an operating room in London, serenading surgeons while they carefully worked to remove a tumour from her brain. <laughs> Fantastic. The video of the operation has been widely shared, but she's barely seen it. Do you remember all of this? Nothing, no. Doctors had asked if she wanted to be awake during surgery. The practice has become more common as it allows surgeons to monitor movement and speech, helping to prevent inadvertent damage to parts of the brain that control motor function. It was clearly the most promising um, method to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Quality of life and good quality of life for me means to be able to play the violin. Surgeons have operated on patients before as they've played instruments. It was even part of an episode of Grey's Anatomy. Turner had seen a video online, which is why she suggested bringing her violin. So she put the challenge, I said, look, what if I play the violin so you can ensure that my ability to do so continues? And when a patient throws you a challenge like that, as a surgeon, we've got to be creative and find a way of doing this. Dr. Kiyomars Ashkan understood her passion. He holds a music degree alongside his medical one, and the team planned the surgery to accommodate her music. We wanted her to wake up in a position that she could already handle a violin and start playing. The bow was another issue. I kept poking somebody in my way over the bow. I didn't realize it was Professor Ashkan who I kept poking. <laughs> the doctors told her they were able to remove 95% of it, a huge relief 
alongside the joy that comes with her ability to keep playing. Briar Stewart, CBC News, on the Isle of Wight. Ah, uh, I guess it's uh, bittersweet. Well, this Sunday will mark another milestone for basketball star Carl English. He's turning in his jersey and retiring from the sport that made him a household name in many places. We'll hear what he's thinking ahead of his retirement ceremony. Well, for sports fans, a big moment at Mile One Arena on Sunday. The jersey belonging to basketball player Carl English will be raised to the rafters in celebration of his retirement. As you likely know, the 39-year-old is calling it a career, and what a career. English sat down with the CBC's Jeremy Eaton to talk about his life in basketball. Ah, I guess it's uh, bittersweet. Um, I haven't really reflected on it as much as I wanted. I think as the competitor I am, it's hard to walk away from anything, especially a sport that I've loved and has been part of me for so long. I've been infatuated with this sport since I've been 10 years old, at least, right? An amount of time and effort and energy and sacrifices and things that I've come and the things that's blessed me with. Again, it's bittersweet, man. It's like, you know, am I ready to walk away? Am I not ready? I was watching some games the weekend. I was ready to run out onto the court. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's father time. It's, it's something that everybody has to face, uh, whether you're ready to or not. But for me, like I've been saying, it gives me a chance to thank the people that supported me when I first started. And that's what it's all about to me. I, I'm not big on celebrating myself or celebrating my career. I'm always look at aspects and I'm never satisfied with anything that I've done. So to me, it's a great way to thank all the fans and the support that they've given me over the last 20 years. Not every professional athlete gets a chance to return home and play in front of a hometown crowd that hadn't seen you play very much. How special is it for you to have the two years that you played with the team and now get to retire and have your number 23 of the St. John's Edge retired? It's been amazing. I mean, I've played all around the world had success everywhere I've played, um, been gifted with so many things, but then to come back home, I think the biggest impact it had has been on the community, on the young kids, and even people our own age. You know, the, the buzz was back in the city on basketball, and basketball is an amazing sport. 
you know, and it brings so many people and so many cultures together. And I felt when I came home, you know, the vibe in the city was alive again because of basketball, and I felt I had a great part of that. And that's what's so special. You know, there's nights I've played in Europe in front of 20, 40,000 people, but when you're down at mile one and the place is rocking and, you know, you know four or 5,000 of them, and, you know, it's a whole different level of accountability. But I relish that. That was the challenge to me. And, and I've always, when I set out here as a young man or a young boy, I call myself, I, I played for Team Canada for almost 15 years, but I've always played for Newfoundland, you know, and I've always praised the place that I've come from and the person that's made me who I am is because of here and because of the people from here. I know that uh, the first two years, uh, there was a lot of success. You had a great relationship with the team and then something seemed to sour. Is this the way that you wanted it to end? <laughs> to be honest, no, but that's, that's life. That's life. I mean, I, again, at an early age, I lost a lot more than I lost last year with the edge. Um, when when you go through the things I've went through at an early age and then later on from losing my parents and then my uncle, it puts a lot of things in perspective. Nothing is given in this world. I don't take anything for granted because tomorrow's not promised. So I live for now and I had to put all this behind me and move forward and inject myself back into the positive, positive person that I am and do things that can help our young people and help, help me and my family. And you know, that's, that's life, that's, that's roll with the punches. It's special. First Mandy's been there from day one, through the thick and the thin. Being the wife of a basketball player is not easy. My three kids and my family are the most important thing in my life. They've always had been, they always will be. And now for them to experience this moment, I think it'll be pretty special. I got a lot of things planned. I'm not sure if they'll keep me here or not, but I mean, there's so many things in life that, you know, that's open and things you can do and things you can accomplish. I mean, basketball, like I said, is a huge part. And to play, the hardest part is not to get out there on the court, but I've learned so much from such great people along the way. You know, I've been fortunate enough to be coached by some of the best, play with some of the best, and all that. I've always been a sponge to take in that knowledge. So now it's my turn to give that back and continue to work in sport or whatever I can to help inspire people. I mean, the book is, is a big part of that. Um, the megaplex I'm trying to build will be a huge part of that. And then just inspiring the youth across the country. I mean, there's, there's lots of doors that will open. Well, if you're one of the many people buying products online because they're cheaper, well, CBC Investigation reveals much of it is counterfeit, possibly dangerous.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. A lot of people looking forward to the weekend, of course, as is normal on a Friday night. I know I've got a great weekend activity of salting ahead of me. <laughs> I was just going to say, what are you doing this Yeah, weekend? and I don't think I'm alone. Still lots of ice around the driveway. Um, so heading into the weekend, Saturday, of course, tomorrow, but Sunday. Sunday actually looks like the best day of the weekend okay. for the majority of us because we're going to see a warm up even more That'll so than we are. Yeah, yeah, it'll be lovely. So let's take a look at what the future tracker is saying. So uh, we will see some flurries in the first uh, overnight and into the first half of the day for most of eastern uh, Newfoundland and then uh, some onshore flurries will continue up along the Long Range Mountains and then even the northern peninsula as well. Otherwise, we should actually see plenty of sunshine through the day as a ridge of high pressure uh, up through Labrador starts to sink a little bit further south. So uh, we're going to see some sunshine for you and then that's going to move across through into the early morning hours. So it does look like it will be lovely. And as far as those temperatures go, we're going to be sitting around uh, zero to minus two for the majority of us across the island and then back down to those minus double digits up through Lab City, minus 12, minus 14 in Nain and then hanging on to those minus single digits through Happy Valley Goose Bay as well as Cartwright, uh, both sitting around minus eight through the day on Sunday. So plenty of sunshine for you through Central. Otherwise, you're looking at coastal Labrador, uh, the chance of a few flurries through the day. So once that uh, high sinks a little bit further south, a little bit of a low is going to skirt through on Monday up through Labrador, going to drop uh, some snow with that. But overall, the winds will finally uh, ease up a little bit. Uh, some onshore flurries again for coastal areas or rather the west coast into Tuesday morning. A low will skirt south of us uh, for Wednesday and then a ridge of high pressure dominates again. However, that one will move uh, back a little bit further north and then the next significant and I say significant because we haven't really seen any significant weather looks like it'll move in on Thursday, but uh, again, way too early to get into any of those details. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise looks pretty lovely by Tuesday up to four degrees and sunshine. So hopefully that continues and that will be an absolutely gorgeous day uh, into Wednesday. That's when we'll start to get a little bit messy in eastern Newfoundland just as that low skirt south. So if it moves a little bit further north, we might see some showers with that one and or flurries sitting around two degrees. But overall, pleasant temperatures as we head through the next couple of days. Central Newfoundland, pretty similar forecast, a couple of degrees cooler, but uh, overall above the zero degree mark into the beginning of next week, but a little bit unsettled for you. For the West Coast, you're looking at temperatures around two degrees, hovering around zero by Wednesday. So either flurries and or some showers on the go for you. And then up through Labrador, especially Eastern Labrador, you're looking at uh, temperatures around minus eight for Sunday, Monday dipping back down to the minus double digits, but then by Tuesday I'll rebound a little bit. Unfortunately, staying gray and then by Wednesday some sunshine and return of that cooler temperature and that's because we've got a little bit of a ridge moving in. It's going to bring some of those colder temperatures and then for Western Labrador minus 12 by Sunday and then up again and then back down again by Wednesday. So I'll have a look at your weather photo when I come back. Well, if you're a little bit reluctant to buy into the whole buy local argument by lots of shops and people in Newfoundland, think about this. Many of us are shopping online, in fact, droves, spending billions of dollars every year. But a marketplace investigation has revealed that you can't always trust what you get, even when you think that the sites and the products all look legitimate. There are counterfeits popping up all over the place in the virtual marketplace. And as Asha Tomlinson reports, some of them could be putting you at risk. Do you shop online? Yes, I do. When you get the products, do you believe that they're real? Of course. <laughs> Why? Because I bought it like from Walmart or some Amazon. Nearly 84% of Canadians shop online. So we wanted to find out if the sites we're shopping on deliver the real deal or could we be buying counterfeit? Apple AirPods on Amazon for $245. Nike Head Jordan Clutch, 85 US. Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Wish, and AliExpress were put to the test. Dozens of products in different categories, including makeup. Three experts weighed in, and they checked out these Kylie Jenner lip products. This packaging actually has a lot of red flags that would be brought to Kylie Cosmetics' attention, and Kylie is actually spelt wrong. It says Kylie Lip Kits by Kylie, K-Y-I-L-E. They suspected the Kylie products from every retailer were fake, except Wish, 
they weren't available on that site. But could they be dangerous too? We send them off to a lab to test for toxic ingredients like mercury and lead. The results? Mercury can have adverse effects on the nervous system. Toxicologist Ryan Prosser confirmed there's mercury in these lip products from AliExpress, double the amount accepted by Health Canada. The fact that it's being applied to the lips um, and that likely percentage of that is being ingested, that's a definite pathway of exposure that I would be concerned about. Then there's this MAC lipstick, also counterfeit and bought on AliExpress. The lead in this lipstick, over 750 times Health Canada's limit. The takeaway from the data you have here is be careful where you buy it from. AliExpress banned the sellers from their platform after we contacted them. We asked all five retailers to come on camera to explain how they're cracking down on counterfeit products. They all say no, but tell us they're committed to stopping the sale of counterfeit products on their site using a combination of the latest technology and enforcement to protect consumers. And they all add if what you buy isn't as advertised, you can always request a refund. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Canadians who were released from a quarantine cruise ship in Japan yesterday have arrived home. They're now getting settled in a hotel and conference centre in Cornwall, Ontario, where they're going to be quarantined for two weeks. The returning passengers will be monitored twice a day for signs of the coronavirus. They will also be provided with mental health support. Previously, they spent two weeks confined to their cabins on the Diamond Princess. The ship, which is docked at Yokohama, has the biggest cluster of COVID-19 outside of mainland China. To Ontario now, thousands of teachers and other educators marched on the streets outside the Ontario Legislature in Toronto today as part of a province-wide strike. You must pull back these cuts. The four main teachers' unions oppose the province's plan for education reform. The government intends to increase some classroom sizes and require high school students to take some e-learning courses. Teachers also want a 2% annual salary increase, but the government is offering just 1%. The province-wide strike has left about 2 million students out of class. This is the first time since 1997 that educators from all the major unions have been on strike on the same day. With Canada's population aging, more and more elderly people are in need of care. But at many nursing homes across the country, it's become ever more difficult to find staff. Well, one home for the aged has found a new way to cope. It's recruiting staff who are in need of a home of their own and bringing them to Nova Scotia all the way from Africa. Shana Luck has that story. Residents and staff at Glenhaven Manor share a few moments of song. Staff outnumber the residents here, but personalized care takes a lot of people. And despite a Canada-wide search, Glenhaven hasn't been able to fill 20 positions. That's why the home is trying something new. It is experimental and we're really excited and, and inspired to be able to be the lead employer in this. The project is a recruiting mission that took Glenhaven to a refugee camp in Kenya, where they did interviews and extended job offers on the spot. In total, 15 refugees are expected to join the nurses' staff in the coming months. The organizations that helped Glen Haven connect with the candidates in Kenya have done this a handful of times before, but never 15 people at once. Now the candidates and their families are applying to move to Canada. Of course, I make job offers all the time and, and um, we hire all the time. We're a big organization, but um, to see that it makes that much of a change in their life and to see that excitement in their eyes, I don't get to see that very often. So, <laughs> Recruiting refugees is new for Glen Haven, but the home knows how to help international staff resettle. This RN moved from the Philippines with his wife. We did some research and we found out that Nova Scotia is one of the most friendliest people in Canada. He offers this to the 15 new staff members. Well, my only advice is like just believe in yourself and continue to pursue your dream. The project to bring workers to Glen Haven is being backed by a number of international refugee organizations, the Federal Immigration Department and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The hope is, if it's successful, this model can be used elsewhere. Shana Lux, CBC News, New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Well, a sign that the winter is at least coming closer to an end. It's maple season time in some parts of the country. 
In southwestern Ontario, farmers are already busy extracting sugary sap from all of their trees. All while the maple tree shortage in Canada continues to get a little more serious. CBC's Amy Dodge caught up with one farmer who's trying to ramp up his production. The first thing Rob Nadeau looks for on his trees are fresh buds. That means that the sap is running. And once the sap is running, that means it's time to start hanging the buckets. But first, Nadeau has to tap the tree. At a slight angle like this, about 30 degrees. And uh, we're facing southwest. There are more than 300 trees collecting sap on this property. And Nadeau isn't slowing down. He has a goal of another 100 trees. This is an operation that stems from his French-Canadian heritage in Quebec. But trees here come with different challenges. It's, it's so labor-intensive that people don't want to do it, and I get it. It's uh, one of the hardest things you can imagine. For six weeks, these buckets are collected every day. And while Nadeau's family production in Quebec collected maple syrup from sugar maples, trees here are silver and red maples. The difference? The sugar content. Sap drawn from these trees average 1.7% sugar. Sugar maples average 2%. That means even more work for Nadeau. Makes it that we have to boil more sap than they do. So he's trying to speed that up. He has ditched the traditional outdoor boiling method for this, a shiny new evaporator. Translation, around 380 litres of sap took 20 hours to boil down to syrup. If this new machine lives up to its promise, more sap in half the time. And now we're going to be able to boil just in 10 hours and have triple the production than we had out there. While his products are being sold in stores in Windsor, Essex, he hopes increasing production speed will also help put more of his products on the table of more Canadians. Amy Dodge, CBC News, Essex County. Oh, how I love maple syrup. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, but where's the snow to pour uh, the taffy That's on? That's right. There's no snow there's there. There's no snow. Well, we've got lots if they want to come here. Here's some. Yeah, here's some snow. That's actually a lot of ice there. But uh, yeah, take a guess at where this is too, and I'll tell you where it is when we come back.
Time to take a look at who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 64th wedding anniversary to Norman and Erla Butt in Swift Current. Bruce and Joan Snook from Fortune celebrated 53 years of marriage on Monday, spending their special day in Alberta with their grandchildren. Happy 50th anniversary today to Herbert and Lorraine Hicks in Shea Heights. Happy 53rd anniversary last Saturday to Clyde and Margaret Oram from Glovertown. Happy 90th birthday to Shirley Best in Old Perlican. And Margaret Tarrant from Lawn turned 90 on Wednesday. And a happy 92nd birthday yesterday to Jean Walters in Boat Harbor West. And that's Jean apparently in her vegetable garden. Quite the veggies. Obviously not taken today though. Congratulations to Nora Normore, uh, who celebrated her 100th birthday on Monday, originally from Taurus Cove. Nora now lives in Whitless Bay. Another century. Happy 100th birthday today to Jean Sparks in Cornerbrook. Happy 57th anniversary today to Norman and Helen Kendall in Morrisville. Yesterday marked 60 years of marriage for Hayward and Lucy Han in Port Blanford. Congratulations. Happy 50th anniversary to Raymond and Patsy Petal in Ladle Cove. Happy 96th birthday to Chess Wilcott, formerly of St. Albans, now lives in Grand Falls, Windsor. Phyllis Forward celebrated her 90th birthday on Wednesday. Lily Woodworth in Point Leamington celebrated her 98th birthday on Tuesday. And Janie Riggs in Grand Bank will celebrate her 92nd birthday on Sunday. Congratulations. Happy 92nd birthday on February 22nd today to Clarence Smith of Bishop's Falls in Grand Falls, Windsor. And Elsie Green celebrated her 98th birthday yesterday in Gander. Happy birthday to Marty Hill in Hermitage who will celebrate her 91st birthday this Sunday. And a happy 65th anniversary to Gerald and Kathleen Hunter in beautiful, awesome, unforgettable Salvage. They're big days today. I hope Brian and Bev have all of Salvage celebrating with you. 57th anniversary greetings going out today to George and Gloria Noseworthy in Leading Tickles. Tom and Jean Piercy will celebrate their 51st wedding anniversary tomorrow. Happy 93rd birthday today to Annie Nichols in Nicholsville. And happy birthday this past Tuesday to Art Sturge who turned 93. Today, Ed and Audrey Rideout in Buren Bay Arm are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And also today, a happy 57th anniversary to Jack and Beatrice Han in Burgio. Tomorrow, Hilda Green from Port of Ask will celebrate her 94th birthday. And a happy 90th birthday this coming Monday to Rachel Spencer, formerly from Pass Island, now in Harbor Breton. Happy 97th birthday this Sunday to Clarence Butler in Bonavista. Happy 51st anniversary to Fred and Verenia Butler in Red Harbor. Happy 53rd anniversary this Sunday to Bill and Bonnie Bonnell in Pasadena. And happy 60th wedding anniversary to Pearl and Jim Blackwood, originally from Greens Pond, now living in Glovertown. And happy 90th birthday greetings to Florence Crocker, formerly from White Bay, now living in Bay Vert. Happy 91st birthday to Dorothy Ross in Buren, who will celebrate her big birthday, the 91st, on Sunday. Happy 57th anniversary greetings to Bonnie and Calvin Evans in Harry's Harbor. Happy 60th anniversary this Sunday to Floss and Guy Freak in Glenwood. Sarah Hederson from Straits View will be 95 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Sarah. And 93rd birthday greetings to Stanley Chaison in Cape St. George. Stanley celebrated on February 8th. Happy 90th birthday next Wednesday to Bert Allen, who will celebrate with his family and friends in Rigolet. Happy 54th anniversary today to Judy and George Delaney in Fox Trap, CBS. Happy anniversary to Ruth and Leslie Roberts, who reside in St. Paul's River, Quebec. They celebrated yesterday. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Morris and Winetta Greening from Musgrave Town. And a happy 100th birthday to Evelyn Jean Sparks in Cornerbrook. And congratulations, everybody. Yeah, so in the Philippines today, a group of students went all out to expose the naked truth about climate change. Yeah, she means naked. <laughs> yes, they undressed and ran across the university campus wearing nothing but masks. Apparently, this naked run is an annual tradition aimed at raising awareness. <laughs> it was started by a fraternity in the 70s to protest government censorship of a film, and it's just kept on going. There you go. Hopefully, it was. Some it was blurry on the screen there. Oh, I wonder why. Hopefully it was a little warmer there than it is uh, in this picture. Let's take a look at our weather photo, maybe? Yeah, there it is. Uh, Tina Stewart sent us this photo of the gully pond entrance to the trailway in Kelligrews. All right, nice mm -hmm. shot, a bit of ice there and some contrast. As I mentioned, ice, gonna try to work on some of the ice around my property in the driveway. And um, you think Sunday's the best day? 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you can tomorrow too, but that means nice. I can procrastinate and not do it uh, <laughs> when I have to. Giving you permission. Yes. Have a great weekend. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you again on Monday. Good night. Yeah. So I heard the theme come up. I did.